Before we begin, let me quickly invite you to be a member of the Salem Athenaeum. We're very grateful for member support and participation. I also wanna tell you about our next program on Wednesday, April 21st at 7 p.m. Journalist Connor Town O'Neill discusses his new book, Down Along That Devil's Bones, A Reckoning with Monuments, Memory, and the Legacy of White Supremacy. Also a reminder to keep your microphones muted until the end when you are encouraged to clap and comment out loud. During the programs, please type your comments and questions into the chat feature. Introducing our speaker this evening is Athenaeum proprietor and writer, Donna Thorland. After graduating from Yale with a degree in classics and art history, Donna managed architecture and interpretation at the Peabody Essex Museum here in Salem. She wrote and directed Eerie Events, their Halloween program. She later earned an MFA in film production from the USC School of Cinematic Arts and has since directed several award-winning short films and developed shows for Sony, Universal, and Disney. Her most recent television credits include Netflix's The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Donna is also the author of four highly acclaimed historical novels from Penguin New American Library. She is married with two cats and divides her time between Salem and Los Angeles. After Lauren Willig speaks about her new book, Band of Sisters, she and Donna will discuss writing women back into history. Excuse me. Donna. Thank you. I am delighted to be introducing my friend, author Lauren Willig tonight. Lauren is in short, the most accomplished woman I know. She is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of more than 20 works of historical fiction, including Band of Sisters, The Summer Country, The English Wife, the Rita award-winning Pink Carnation series, and three novels co-written with Beatrice Williams and Karen White. Her books have been translated into over a dozen languages, awarded the Rita, Booksellers Best and Golden Leaf Awards, and chosen for the American Library Association annual list of the best genre of fiction. An alumna of Yale University, she has a graduate degree in history from Harvard and a JD from Harvard Law School. She lives in New York City with her husband, two young children, and vast quantities of coffee. I've been hoping to lure her to the Athenaeum for some time, so tonight's virtual visit is for me one of the silver linings of the pandemic. Lauren and I have known each other since we were undergraduates at Yale, where we were both members of the Athenaeum's spiritual New Haven cousin, the Elizabethan Club, a combination literary club, private library, and tea salon. Since then, we've shared a publisher, survived several harrowing literary festivals together, and developed a television show based on her now classic books, the Pink Carnation series. Chances are you have at least one of her titles on your shelf at home. But if not, Band of Sisters is a fantastic introduction to her work that writes a fascinating but forgotten group of women back into history. Take it away, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you everyone for having me here to the Athenaeum tonight. I am so thrilled to be joining you. Um, I only regret that it is not in person, but we will have to save that for happier times. Um, I have to say, yes, Donna and I have known each other since before I was old enough to drink, which tells you how far back we go. And from the moment I met Donna, I admired her immensely. And there is no one whose judgment in literature or life I trust more. So I am so thrilled to have her here with me tonight. And when I heard that she was going to be introducing me, I immediately strong armed her into doing the program with me. So I'm going to talk about Smithies for a bit and then drag Donna back up on stage with me so we can discuss all of our very many thoughts. And we do have many thoughts about how women have been represented in historical fiction and why it's so important that we bring them back into the narrative, um, which Donna does brilliantly in her own American Revolutionary books. But today we're not talking about the American Revolution. We're moving up a couple of centuries to World War I um, and the brave women of Smith College who went abroad to bring humanitarian aid to French villagers while the shells were falling all around them. 
So do not feel bad, by the way, if you haven't heard of the Smith College Relief Unit before. I have to confess, I had not either until I stumbled upon them while researching something entirely different. I was co-writing a book with two good friends of mine, Beatrice Williams and Karen White. And one of the things we needed to know for the book were, was what Christmas customs were, would have been like in Picardy in World War I. And so there I was desperately Googling Christmas, Picardy, World War I, because we needed to know things like would the classic bouche de Noël still have been served under the German occupation? Because these are the things that drive authors utterly nuts. So I was Googling away like mad and up popped a memoir by a Smith alumna talking about throwing Christmas parties for French villagers right behind the front lines. And I thought, wait, what are a bunch of Smithies doing in the Psalm? dressing up as Father Christmas. This makes no sense. I've stumbled on a work of fiction. This has to be someone's invention. And so of course I dropped everything. I read that memoir and I discovered it was in fact a memoir. It was true. There were Smithies 10 miles from the front lines dressing up as Father Christmas and throwing Christmas parties for French village children while the shells fell around them. Um, so of course I immediately dropped everything I meant to be doing, I was meant to be doing and went to see what I could find on the Smith College Relief Unit. And there wasn't terribly enough, uh, terribly much. There have been no books written about them. There are a few lines here and there about, uh, you know, in books about Americans who went abroad during World War I. And there was a pamphlet published in the 60s in which their story was told through excerpts of their letters. Um, of course, I gobbled that up. Um, and so here's the basic story of the Smith College Relief Unit. So, I mean, we all know about how France was occupied during World War II, but what many people don't know is that France was also occupied during World War I. Um, not as much of it, but some of it. It was basically a practice run for the Germans. They marched in until they got stopped and the trenches were dug. But life was not pleasant for those on the wrong side of the trenches. The Germans did not occupy gently. And in March of 1917, when the Brits and the French managed to push the Germans back, not far, but a bit, the Germans determined to wreak maximum havoc before they went. They gathered up all of the villagers from the villages they had been occupying, moved them to one village, and then went back and systematically destroyed everything in all of the villages that might offer either shelter or sustenance. They broke the plows, they poisoned the wells, they destroyed the houses, you name it, they wrecked it. They were very, very thorough. And then they took the villagers, and when, when I say villagers, we're talking about the very old, the very young, and the infirm, because the able-bodied were all either off at war or had already been sent off to work camps in Germany. They had rounded up the teenage girls and put them on trains to Germany. Their families, of course, never knew whether they would see them again or where they were. It was really heartbreaking. So these remaining villagers who were in desperate straits already were told by the Germans, it's okay, you can go home now and they sent them back to their ruined villages to sicken and starve with the idea that this would be a burden on the French war effort. But they had not reckoned with one Smith College alumna. And here's where I'm gonna get really daring and see if I can screen share with you. Let's see if I can make this work, ha ha. Yeah, see if there's anything we're kind of forgetting or whatever. Okay, whoops, and I'm on the wrong slide. Let me scooch back, okay. Here we go. This is Harriet Boyd Hawes, Smith College alumna, archeologist, humanitarian, and occasional war nurse. Now she heard about this tragedy in the Psalm and decided immediately that what was needed to deal with this problem was American college women, of course. Um, and so she came back to the States and delivered a rousing speech at the Smith College Club in Boston, urging her comrades to arms. Her plan was both very simple and very ambitious. It was to get a group of Smithies out into the Somme and have them rebuild these villages and these villagers' lives from the bottom up. They would deal with basic things like delivering medical care, rebuilding houses, and you know, providing furniture. I mean, people are sleeping in mud pl on planks in the mud, um, but also with larger projects like rebuilding cottage industries, um, getting the schools up and running again and getting the kids back in school, which let me tell you really resonates with me right now. Um, and also rebuilding the agricultural base of the region by bringing in seeds and livestock. I mean, it was an incredibly ambitious plan. People were inspired and they 
donated money, she joked that she called it the Smith College Relief Unit because the initials spelled screw and she intended to screw everyone out of all of their money. But so people donated and they signed up. And within three months, she had a group of 18 women, the brand new Smith College Relief Unit and their uniforms of gray with touches of French blue. And you can see them there, that's the original unit. Um, she joked that of all the difficulties they faced, getting supplies, getting funds, getting passes, the hardest thing was designing that uniform, that that was what almost broke them. Um, you know, as hilarious as that is, that wasn't entirely true. The hardest thing was getting sponsored because not anyone could waltz into the war zone. You needed passes in a variety of colors. And the Red Cross would not touch the Smithies with a 10 foot pole. They thought this was an absolutely dreadful idea. And so the American Fund for the French Wounded tentatively agreed to sponsor the Smith College Relief Unit, but they were very much on probation and they knew a lot was riding on this because the other stated aim of the unit, in addition, of course, to helping French women and children was also to prove to the world what the American woman could do. I mean, this is a time when women do not yet have the vote, when the vote is being voted on in several states. And so it was a clearly expressed ambition on the part of their founder that by going out there, by doing this impossible thing, they would show the world that women were worthy of all sorts of responsibilities and the vote. So you know, no pressure there. So these women embarked on the SS Rochambeau in early August of 1917. And this is when the reality really hit some of them because one of the first things that happened was they were given metal dog tags with their names on them so their bodies could be identified in the event they were torpedoed and their corpses had to be recovered. You know, nice, cheerful stuff. They, whoops, sorry, they flipped ahead too soon. They got to Paris and it was really born in upon them that this was not the Paris many of them remembered. This was the Paris where there were air raids every night where most of the women wore black um, and the men they saw didn't have all of their own limbs. The women wrote home that they felt guilty for having all of their arms and legs because most of the people they saw were maimed in some way. Um, the unit, so they were meant to be getting their trucks and their passes and getting out to the front and doing their work. But of course, everything took longer. Their trucks were lost somewhere. They had to get their passes. Oh, Angela Williams too. And they're, they're sorry, the you see that? Oops. Is there a mic that's active? Oh, thank you. Anyway, so the Smith, you know, they were farmed out to other aid organizations. Some of them worked for the Salvation Army doing canteen work. Some of them gave, made surgical supplies in a pop-up workhouse in the Bois de Boulogne. I mean, morale was low. The unit was almost broken up before they began. And on top of that, they made the mistake of touring the American Ambulance Hospital at Neuilly. Um, this is the American Ambulance Hospital at Neuilly. I'm showing you a picture of the hospital rather than what they saw there, because what they saw there was really deeply distressing. The hospital was at the time doing innovative reconstructive surgery for soldiers whose faces had been blown apart by shells. And the women were treated to a very in-depth presentation involving before and after pictures and plaster casts. One of them passed out on the spot and then had a nervous breakdown and needed to go home. So, you know, things were not going well for the Smithies or the Smith College Relief Unit at this point, but fortunately their founder had the bright idea of deciding if their trucks wouldn't come to them, they would go to their trucks. And she put the chauffeurs, the women who could drive on overnight train to San Nazar, where they found their trucks in boxes, in pieces on the docks. And they were like, well, you know, I guess that's it. And she handed them a wrench and said, you're Smithies, you're bright women, you can do this, put these trucks together. And so they did. And there they are in their truck. Can you imagine putting that together from scratch, having had no you know, mechanical experience before? I certainly can't. Um, but their founder's theory was very much that a bright college educated woman should be able to do anything. So they finally made it out to their headquarters in the front where they found things much worse than they had ever anticipated. They were staying in a little village called Greycourt on the grounds of a ruined chateau. And if that sounds glamorous, well, when you look at the picture, you can see that the chateau was missing several crucial things like a roof. The Germans had really thoroughly bombed it. The Smithies were living not in the chateau, but in these tiny little army barracks behind it. Um, that little barrack you see there housed six women. That's a two-room barrack and they were three to a room. 
it was the, the accommodations were not pleasant and they were very, very cold, but they were still doing better than the villagers they were there to serve. These are the villagers of Grey Court who, when their houses were destroyed, moved into the cellars of the old stables. And you can see those are the stables behind them. The roof was blown in, but they counted themselves very lucky to have even a bit of a roof and some walls because the people in the neighboring villages were faring even worse. You know, the Smith women, these were not wilting violets. Many of these women had social service experience or social work experience. This was a great age of the settlement house where upper middle class American women would go into slums and do charity work in you know, depressed regions of New York and Philadelphia and Boston. So many of these women have worked in with really horrible urban poverty, but they had never seen anything like what they saw in these villages in France. One wrote home about one of their villages in which there were 50 children, not one of them well. I mean, that line just sticks with me in the most horrible way. The unit's doctor wrote that she had never seen anything in all her years of serving in the slums of Philadelphia like she saw in the Psalm. Um, and the worst was the children. Uh, they got there, they threw a party. They thought the children would run and play and be merry, but the children were quiet and they didn't run. I mean, these were children who had known three years of war. Some of them had known nothing but war and the Smithies had to start from scratch to try to teach them to run and play and trust again. And it was hard and heartbreaking work. And to make matters worse, their agricultural specialist got strand, well, was she had a job at the Department of Agriculture in DC and didn't make it out with the rest of them. She couldn't come out till November. So these lovely upper middle class urban women were there dealing with chickens and cows. And most of them had never met a chicken before. Mistakes ensued. So, but they did do two very clever things. And one was they started a traveling store where the idea was they didn't want the people of these French villages to feel like beggars. They wanted them to you know, get back up on their feet. And so what they did was they ran a store out of one of their trucks where they sold things way below cost, trusting that the villagers would think they were just stupid Americans who didn't understand French money and that they were pulling a fast one on them. And they did, and it was brilliant and it worked really well. The other brilliant thing they did was in their second week there, they seconded a priest from a nearby regiment and held a mass at the village church in Grey Court, the first mass that had been held there since the beginning of the war. And this was the best thing they could possibly have done. It won over the French authorities utterly. And from then on, the Smith unit could do no wrong and any help they wanted from the local French authorities was there for the asking. Um, so it seemed like things were finally starting to fall into place when right after that mass, their director suddenly resigned. And this was where I was like, wait, what? Because their director just ups and leaves. It made no sense to me whatsoever. Um, and there were some comments about her leaving for her health. It was very confusing, but her health was never mentioned before. And in one snippet of a letter, it said that she was going to resign as director, but then stay on with them. And then two days later, she's gone entirely. And I was like, wait, there's more to this story. There's something that they are not telling in these excerpts that are publicly available. And so, and there was also a line in that initial memoir I stumbled on that had really caught my attention. A one of those throwaway lines that says more than it means to, where the memoirist had commented that the only limitations to their high endeavor were the limits set by fellowship and their own personalities. And I spent 13 years in all girls school, limits of fellowship and personalities, I know those intimately. I thought, oh my God, something happened. And so I flung myself on the generosity of the librarians at Smith Special Collections. And in this picture here, you see a fraction of the papers they shared with me. And so I want to leave some time to talk with Donna. So I'm gonna to start to wind it up here. But in those pages, I found answers to all of the questions I had had while reading the publicly available bits and pieces, including the fact that there was in fact a coup and their director was in fact forced to resign. But despite that resignation, the Smithies continued with her plan and pulled together and really did become a band of sisters and did really truly incredible things both you know, throughout their time there and then when the Germans broke through the lines. So I'm gonna close up the screen share now and turn it over and let's see, is there a way to invite Donna up here so we're both 
we're two big faces. Yeah, I'll take care of it. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a technological incompetent, so our brave new world has been very difficult for me. Okay, there you are. Oh, yay. Yes, we're two big faces now. I'm so excited that you came with this book. Uh, it's been one of my favorites for the year. And uh, as I mentioned in our introduction, we've survived quite quite a few signings and literary festivals together. And one thing we always talk about uh, are the books that got us writing historical fiction. So I'm, I'm gonna start uh, as a catalyst with my, uh, my historical fiction versus biography origin story. Uh, I went to a small uh, elementary school in New Jersey that had a wonderful little library, one room, that uh, all the classes were taken to one day a week for an hour. And uh, it had a huge biography section and a total of two biographies about women. Uh, my choices were Cleopatra or Helena Rubinstein. So, you know, Queen of the Nile or Invent Cold Cream. Uh, but what there was, was a wonderful collection of historical fiction about women. Uh, you know, thinking about books like uh, Anya Seton's Catherine or The Winter Woman, who you wouldn't, you couldn't find a biography of those women to read at that age, but you could find historical fiction. And I had a very similar start, not the biography bit, because I went to a little all girls school in New York, where you know, there was a very heavily curated collection of biographies of women. But someone when I was six years old, gave me E.L. Konigsberg's A Proud Taste for Scarlet and Miniver, which for those of you who haven't encountered it, is her rather bizarre piece of historical fiction about Eleanor of Aquitaine. But it's Eleanor's life recounted by all of her various buddies and enemies in life as they are all sharing their memories as they sit up there on clouds on heaven waiting for enough lawyers to be admitted to argue Henry II's case before St. Peter. I mean, it's the most bizarre framing device you can imagine, but it's hilarious and it's brilliant. And I fell in love with Eleanor of Aquitaine and I just wanted to read more things like that. I went to my school librarian and begged for books. And somehow I think she wound up handing me Jean Plady. And so I went from a proud taste of, for Scarlet and Miver to Victoria Victorious and the whole Queens of England series. And, you know, our library at Chapin was very well stocked with Jean Plady and Nora Lofts and Anya Seton and all of those other, you know, historical fiction greats who you know, really brought all of these women to life for our generation. I think it's fair to say that there's a 20th century vein of historical fiction uh, that extends into our own 21st century. Uh, that is women writing women's stories back into history through fiction, especially where a popular biography doesn't exist. Or in the case of the Smith College women, it's remarkable to think there isn't a book, there isn't even a monograph out there for to find these women's stories in. Uh, I recall, I think we've talked about this before, uh, we share a, one of our favorite authors, Dorothy Dunnett, who's uh, heroes weren't always women. She read a lot of strong women, but the impact that historical fiction can have uh, is shocking. I went to a signing of hers at Waterstones when we had one in Boston, and the room was pretty full, 50 or 60 women sitting there. Uh, and at some point at the end of the talk, half of them uh, raised their hands to confess that reading uh, her Lyman series had turned them into academics, and the other half raised their hands and admitted that she turned them into authors. So there's sort of a chain of transmission, I think, from, from some of these authors to, they create others. And historical fiction is a gateway drug. I have had so many people email me over the years telling me that my Pink Carnation series made them decide to become grad students, which is really hysterical because there's a framing character in those books who's a very disgruntled grad student. So you would think it would have the opposite effect, but so many people have told me they study history because of those books, which I just think is marvelous. But I think it's also because so many people I've spoken to have this bizarre idea that history is flat and boring. And I think it's because it is so often taught as just a series of dates and events, as opposed to seeing the more human side of it. 
I mean, I think because we both read Anya Seaton and Jean Plady, we grew up thinking of these characters as sort of distant cousins whose activities you gossiped about. All of the great world events were you know, seen in the light of people's personal relationships. You know, who was fighting with whom? And so all of these things were brought down to the human level in a way they're not in the classroom. I don't want to spoil the pink carnation for people who haven't read it, but uh, one of its delights, tiny spoiler, uh, is that what Lauren does is she takes uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel myth and lore and flips it to tell it from a different perspective, revealing that in fact, the greatest of the flower spies, and she's got many flower spies in the series, was a woman. Uh, it is similar in a way to what, if you read it for the first time, that revelation to reading wide Sargasso Sea and realizing that you're seeing Jane Eyre from the other woman's perspective. I, I highly recommend all of the pink books to anyone, anyone who has not yet had, had the experience. Well, one, one interesting experience of writing the pink books in which the women take on the roles of spies was it made me realize how much our ideas of historical periods are shaped by popular culture and how limited our impression of women's roles are. And you know, Donna has written four books set during the American Revolution and has had similar experiences of people sending letters saying, but women during the 18th century would never have done X, Y, Z. And you know, I found it so fascinating how strong our preconceptions of what women did and didn't do in other eras were. And one of the things that really struck me when writing Band of Sisters was how strongly I was surprised by finding Smithies in the Psalm. And you know, I discovered as I was writing and researching this book that in fact there were tons of American women in the Psalm. I mean, not as cool as the Smithies. I still insist that they were unique in their own way, but there were far more women that we have ever heard of running around there in the war zone. Um, I'm doing a presentation for the Vassar Club of Hudson Valley next month. And so I was poking around to see if I could find anything about the Vassar College Relief Unit, which was formed in imitation of the Smith unit after the Smithies sort of became a press sensation in their time. And one of the facts that jumped out at me as I was trying to find bits about the Vassar unit, which is even less well known than the Smith unit, was that there were 200 Vassar College grads who served in France in World War I. I mean, that just boggled my mind, 200. And when you think of what the class size was and that that was just Vassar, and then you multiply it I mean, there were all of these women running around the war zone in World War I who were not nurses. And yet our impression of what women did in World War I is so entirely, you know, the nurses standing there near the trenches while the men do their badly things with their little mustaches. Lauren, is there anything being written nonfiction on either of the units now that you know of, or is it still? Yes, there is a wonderful professor at Smith who actually, I believe, started as a specialist in 18th century theater, but found the Smithies, the Smith College Relief Unit, while teaching at Smith and is now writing a monograph about them. And I am so ridiculously excited about this book. I can't wait to read it and see everything I got wrong. Um, but I, I don't know when it will be out because academic publishing moves like the windmills of the gods. Um, the last time I, I corresponded with her, she was on her way to Grey Court to go do some on-site research. But I really, I highly, once that book comes out, everyone should read it because what those women did is truly incredible and stranger than fiction. That's fantastic. I want to turn it over to questions from the group, but I have no idea how to do that. So hopefully Jean Marie or Carolyn is... Uh, <laughs> Guild. Um, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Um, if people want to put their questions in the chat, that'd be great. Um, it's probably the quickest way to sh uh, ask a question. Uh, what age on average were these women? Um, Clara asks. That's a great question. Because the funny thing is I found because they referred to themselves as college women. When I say that, I realize people tend to assume that they were young. And in fact, they were they were not young, they were not not young, but they ran the gamut from the oldest of the unit was class of 1888, 
Um, so in her 50s, and the youngest was class of 1914, so about 24. Um, the median age was roughly 29. There were a number of 30th birthday parties in the psalm. So these were all really experienced, sophisticated women. Um, they were not girls, although it cracks me up, their founder, who realized from the first that they were going to need to have a PR effort, a, you know, a public relations effort in order to, she knew that their, their position was tenuous. And so she decided that the more the papers wrote about them, the less likely they would be to get kicked out. She came up with the name Le Collegien Americaine for the Smith unit, because she said that a simple handle was just the thing for the French press, but she didn't realize she had mistranslated. And Collegian American actually meant, you know, American upper schoolers. And so they, over their time there, they changed their name to Les, da Les Dames Americains, which really more accurately reflected who they were and their age group. But so these were roughly women in there. The, the bulk of the women were sort of class of 1909, 1911, thereabouts, with a couple of outliers. Were they all able to speak French? Some spoke French much better than others. Um, they mostly spoke French to some degree or other. Some were fluent. Um, their assistant director was actually part Belgian. And it's funny because her letters were the most smithy and colloquial letters. They sound just like all the other women's letters, but she had spent a great deal of time living in Belgium and was very, very, very fluent in French. I mean, it was one of her mother tongues. Some of the women, not so much. You know, they were sort of learning as they went along and had some interesting mishaps. There was one story that I co-opted for the book where two best friends from Smith had come, had joined the unit together and they got lost when their truck broke down one night in the snow and they wound up going into a very dodgy inn. And of the two of them, one spoke very good French and one spoke very bad French. And the one who spoke very bad French was very excited just to be in out of the warm and there was stew cooking and she was like, let's stay and eat. But the one who spoke good French heard the guys who were in there talking and asking about rooms upstairs to take the women and they were coming to help them take their coats off and the one who spoke French was like we've got to get out of here and the one who didn't was like but there's stew and she's like I will explain to you and translate to you later and dragged her friend out as fast as she could because the the other one her French was not good enough or not colloquial enough to understand the kind of designs these men had upon their persons. Oh, the disc, okay, can you discuss the question to the Great Court Gates? So the Great Court Gates are an iconic symbol of Smith College. You know, everyone who's been to Northampton, you have seen them, you have walked by them. Um, and my Smithy friends tell me that there are considerable legends that have developed around them. The Great Court Gates were installed at Smith in 1924 by the trustees of Smith College, who had them specially made as a replica of the gates at the Smithies headquarters as a tribute to the Smith College Relief Unit and the amazing work they did in France. So those gates are, they are an exact replica of the ones at the Chateau where the Smith College Relief Unit was staying. Um, you could see the gates, I guess, sort of vaguely in that picture I showed you before. They were also notable for there was one Red Cross driver who was always driving his truck into the gates. Um, they couldn't figure out if he was doing it on purpose or by accident, because every time he crashed his truck into the gates, and those must have been some sturdy gates because they survived this, he would get to hang out there for a couple of days with the Smith College Relief Unit while his truck was being fixed. Um, but anyway, but the gates, they, they were... The reason they're called the Great Court Gates is because the Smith College Relief Unit's headquarters was at this village of Great Court. And actually, originally, when I started writing the book, I had planned to open the book with the scene where the gates are being um, at the unveiling of the gates in 1924, when the old unit all got back together to be there to be honored. But then there were too many spoilers involved, so I had to cut that. But that's how the Great Court Gates came to Smith. Oops, I saw another question pop up, and that popped down again. Sorry, um, are they memorialized anywhere in the Psalm? Okay, you know, that I do not know because I was not able with lockdown and everything and because I have two very small children, I was not able to go to the Psalm in their footsteps. So I'm not sure they were awarded orders by the French government at the time. Um, and there was a Smithy in, at, there was a smithy in the psalm as late as 1922, but as to plaques and memorials, I don't know. Oh, were they ever recognized by the government? Yes, they were all given orders from the French government um, in token of the, the work they did. Um, 
they did some truly heroic things during the German invasion that you can read about in the book. Um, let's see, sorry, oops. I realized I missed a question. Oh, so, yeah, oh. One, um, what about married versus single? Did they leave jobs behind in the States? Yes, to all of the above. So the bulk of the women in the unit were single, but some were married. The unit's doctor was married. Um, the, their founder was married and actually left two children behind in the States, um, which was one of the things that made me think it was so strange when she suddenly upped and resigned. But their unit's founder had a husband um, who, she was an archeologist, her husband was also an archeologist and they had two young kids. But as she put it in a speech, all was well with her kids and there were other children with, all, with whom all was not well and they too were precious in the eyes of God. But she was the only one I know of that actually had children she left behind to go do this. Most of the women were unmarried, although one actually wound up engaged and married as a result of their time in the Psalm, because the Smithies had a number of admirers. As you can imagine, they became incredibly popular. These were the first American women that some of these soldiers had seen in years. And every single American aviator, Canadian forester, British officer, or American engineer flocked to their headquarters at Grey Court. And their letters home about this are simply hilarious because they write about the men coming up with these random excuses to drop by. Like, hi, I just happened to wander by your deserted chateau to borrow half a cup of ration sugar. And they, they actually started making lists of the really dreadful excuses all these men used for stopping by their chateau. And in fact, after a while, they had to issue a directive that they were only having callers on Sundays because all of these guys were interfering with their work. Um, but one woman did form a, a, well, actually, one of the other letters home that I found so hilarious was a woman writing that there were many affairs going on in the unit at present between the Smithies and their various admirers. But the hardest part was that there was no privacy in which to conduct them because they were all crammed into these little barracks. And so there were a couple of letters where it was basically just like college where you'd have someone writing home, you know, I really want to go to bed, but there are three aviators sitting in the bedroom chatting with so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so, and I wish they'd just go home so I could go to sleep. Um, so they really had, they had a really, you know, through all the hardship and the difficulties, they also had a really good time in the Psalm, but yes. So, um, but most of them were unmarried. They did leave jobs behind. Some of them were social workers. Some of them were teachers. Some of them were ladies of leisure. A couple of them who went over were sort of, you know, well-heeled women in their late twenties who spent time traveling with their families. And, you know, many of them had spent a couple of years at least doing settlement house work, but often, you know, after that became ladies of leisure. So it was a mixed bag. The, there were you know, a little bit of everything there. Oops, one new message. Um, the 18 lived at Grey Court. Yes, so they lived in these, they, were, they had three tiny little barracks behind the chateau. The funny thing is, although there were 18, there were seldom ever 18 there at one time. Because you know, I mentioned their director resigning. What I didn't mention was that in the same week of sort of the original 18 who were there, one woman had a nervous breakdown and broke her contract and went home. Another's mother died. And so she had to go home. And another woman accompanied her back to Paris to wait with her while she sailed. And then their director resigned. So they were almost immediately at less than full force. And there was no time during their time in France when they were up to the full 18 at any one time because something was always happening to someone. One woman broke her collarbone and broke it badly enough that she had to go into Paris for surgery. And so there was this constant back and forth thing where, and they were also, they were on six month contracts. So in January of 1918, the original contracts were up and a bunch of women decided, okay, that was an interesting experience. Now I'm going home. Um, one woman actually went home to marry the man she had been waffling about marrying because as she wrote home, she had seen something so awful, it had changed her entire view of life. And she was going to marry him after all. And actually my college roommate and I spent hours speculating about what the awful thing could have been. But anyway, so a lot of people left, one woman left to go and write books about it. And then made a very good living writing books about her six months in Grey Court. But they were supposed to have replacements, but their replacements couldn't get there because they couldn't get passes. And so when the Germans actually invaded, there were only, I can't remember the exact number because, you know, pandemic brain, and it's been a year or so since I was 
in these papers, but there were only about nine women left at Grey Corps when the German invasion happened, who did you know, the work of about 30. Yes, Georgia Reed and Ruth Gaines, not Georgia Reed, but Ruth Gaines was the woman who wrote the two memoirs I initially stumbled on, the ladies of, uh, sorry, um, the ladies of Grey Court and a village in Picardy. So she was my, my window into the unit. And I am so grateful for her, to her because, but for those memoirs, I would never have known of the unit's existence. Genre. Um, is that question as to the genre of the book? Oops. Oh, how much in danger were the women in when the Germans invaded? Any info on how the Germans responded to them? Well, what happened was, so in February of 1918, the Brits took over the Smithy section of the war zone and they wanted the Smith women out because there were rumors that the big push might happen at any moment. And they felt that the Smith women would be a liability, that they would have to protect them. And the Smith women were like, have you met us? No, we're really, we're not those sorts of women. And also everyone had been talking about the big push for so long. That was one of those things where no one believed it was actually going to happen. It had become almost a joke. You know, they were carrying gas masks around and they were in readiness for the big push. But it was like, yeah, they said last week the big push was coming. This isn't going to happen. Um, and so, and actually by that point, the Smith College Relief Unit had become so popular and so productive that the French lobbied the Brits and insisted that they be allowed to stay. And so the Smith College Relief Unit at the time of the German invasion had the odd experience of being pretty much the only women left in the war zone because the Brits evicted all of the other female aid workers, just not the Smith College Relief Unit. And so when the Germans did finally break through in March of 1918, um, and this is one of the things you can't make up, but, you know, I swear it happened exactly this way. A British officer on horseback came riding out of the mist, shouting, the Germans have broken through, you have to evacuate. And so the Smithies got into their trucks, but instead of driving away from the German advance, they drove towards it because they knew there were villages in the way of the advance and villagers who were stranded there, who wouldn't be able to get away fast enough on their own feet, lugging their bundles and possessions. And so the Smithies drove towards the invasion and started picking up evacuees and driving them to farther away villages and spent the whole day ignoring British armies to, oh, sorry, British orders to evacuate and evacuating villagers. And eventually the Brits gave up. They realized that the Smithies were just gonna do this and they would start giving them instructions. Like there's a village over there that hasn't been evacuated yet, or if you wanna drive this way. And so for a, roughly a week, the Smithies were constantly on the move, falling back farther and farther. And as they fell back with the Germans advancing and advancing and advancing relentlessly, they would do pop-up canteens where they would feed people who are being put on trains to be evacuated to other parts of France. They became a lost persons bureau where they would reunite families who had lost each other in the craziness of the evacuation. Um, they set up pop-up medical clinics. And but again, all of this on the move, falling back, not knowing where they were gonna sleep on any at given night and just but continuing wherever they landed to go and do their good work and keep people moving until finally the Red Cross was like, it's too dangerous. We have to get you guys further away. And ironically, they got them further away to Amiens which was bombed that very night. And it was the closest the Smithies came to death because the house they were in just narrowly escaped being bombed. And they were like, you know, we could have kept evacuating people. We were safer doing that. But eventually, you know, they fished up in Beauvais where they were also bombed. But yeah, they, they, they were in a lot of danger. They never fell under German control. Um, they always moved just that little bit ahead fast enough that the Germans didn't actually catch them. Um, but they were, it's amazing to me that they all came through unscathed. And I swear they did in real life. And actually when I was researching the Vassar unit, one of the things I discovered was that four Vassar grads did die in France, um, which makes it all the more amazing to me that the Smithies, they are in the midst of the German invasion, every single one of them came through. Oh, the name of the Smith professor rang the monograph, Jennifer Hall um, hyphen Witt, W-I-T-T. And she is lovely and I cannot wait to read her book. And she's writing her book is going to be a work of nonfiction about the unit. And so I am really eager to read it 
and see you know, what it looks like from another perspective. Because of course the experience of writing fiction as Donna can tell you is so different from writing nonfiction. You're looking for different things. So you know, there were times when their letters were so amazing and the details were so rich that I was almost tempted just to drop the whole novel <laughs> and do an annotated version of their letters because I could cram more of what they actually did in that way. In writing a novel, there was a lot, although I didn't, I didn't invent anything. Anything that happens to the women in this book happened to the real women. There was a lot I had to cut out um, because you just, you can't fit everything in without it being war and peace length. And only Margaret Mitchell can get away with that. Oh, did any of them have to learn to use weapons? Well, there was one woman who wrote home that she got a little gun and she intended to try to pot a German because she had heard if you did that, they gave you the quad de guerre and 500 francs. But she was the only one I know of in the group who had any weaponry. <laughs> um, they were really, that's the weird thing about the Smith unit. One of the things I find both so fascinating and so charming about them is they are, they are really, they're nine miles from the front, they're right there. But because they're working to do reconstruction work, their lives are really focused on building people's lives back up and not on the war. The war is very much there, but they're not involved in the military side of it at all. Um, and the funny thing is, you know, so they have, they, they spend so much time with their aviator friends and their engineer friends and so on. And you know, the engineers, the 11th American engineers, they're in one of the first battles that Americans are in in France in the at Cambrai, and you know they they they're really distressed when their their engineer friends are ambushed, but no one wants to really talk about the war with them. They are they are you know they're people's comfy corner where they go to talk about things other than the war. So they're in the war and not in the war at the same time in the strangest and most fascinating sort of way. They also complain, by the way, that because of censorship, they know less ten miles from the front than they did when they were back in New York, where the American papers carried much fuller accounts of what was going on that they're able to get right there. There's one woman, the same woman who got a gun and wanted to pot a German, who is constantly trying to get a look at um, classified military maps because her fiance is a, it had signed up and was about to be sent out. So she was scrounging for any information she could find to send home to him. So she would be in like people's offices and be like, so that's a map with pins in it. Hmm. But the rest of them, there's really surprisingly little discussion of the actual war. And some of that is of course, because they knew their letters would be censored. And some of this because their lives were so focused on, oh my God, why aren't the chickens laying eggs? Let's see, am I up to date on the questions? Is there anyone whose questions I've missed? Okay, well, if anyone has any other questions for me, feel please, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, um, did you get the one about um, where you did your research or did you use the Smith archives? Oh no, I missed that one. Sorry, I was watching them as they popped up at some, you know, on the bottom of my screen, and I think I missed some that way. Um, I did, and I didn't. So when I realized that there was something missing from the story I was reading, I, you know, I went to the Smith College Special Collections Library Guide, and I saw that they had an amazing collection of papers from the members of the Smith College Relief Unit. But I also, at that point, I had a one-year-old and a five-year-old. And I knew that there was no way I was going to get up to Northampton. You know, if I did, it would be for a day or two. It wouldn't be the amount of time I would need to really sit and go through these papers because I've spent time in the archives before, and it always takes you a while to ramp up and get used to the handwriting before you get really get on a roll. And I knew that this was going to be weeks and weeks of work. And so I emailed the librarians at Smith College Special Collections. They had something on their website about digitizing documents. I thought, ooh. So I emailed them and said, well, these are the documents, I'm, the folders I'm interested in. Would it be possible to digitize these? And this lovely librarian wrote back saying, well, do you realize how many documents are in this folder? It turned out that it was actually thousands of pages of material I was asking for. And they digitized it all for me. You know, thousands of pages of these letters and also took pictures of the letters for me in situ so I could get a sense of what they looked like there in the archives, which was really beyond lovely of them. So I didn't get to actually go to the archives, but the amazing librarians of Smith, Smith College Special Collections 
brought the archives to me. And what was so amazing about it was it wasn't just their letters. There was also errata, like um, there were scores from the songs they learned so they could sing them at that first mass. There were doggerel poems that they wrote about each other. And there were photographs with their own handwritten um, labels on them. And it just, it was an incredible experience going through all that. Um, let's see. Oh my goodness, someone who's related to Ruth Gaines. That's marvelous. I owe you and your ancestress a huge debt of gratitude. Um, oh, sounds like a scandal with the director. Any ideas? Well, actually, that was one of the things I did find out when I finally got into the papers. So their director was a committed humanitarian who had very firm ideas about what they were there to do. Her idea was that they were there to help villagers. They were not there as part of the war effort. They were an independent, self-funded unit there to rebuild the lives of women and children, and the war was kind of happening around them. Um, when they were stranded in Paris for a month, some of the women kind of got the idea that maybe they would be better off doing canteen work in Paris, doing things for our boys, you know, the American troops who had just come into the war, rather than going off and risking their lives in the front doing things for French peasants. And, you know, it became a, a really big divide within the unit. Um, one of them felt very, very strongly about it and wrote to the committee. And to be fair, their director was the sort of, she was the kind of brilliant that some people like and that rubs other people very wrong. She was erratic and impulsive. She was a genius. She was also not tactful. And so there were probably legitimate objections there, but there was also this big divide about the nature and purpose of the unit. The irony is that although the group who felt they, that their director ought to go succeeded, the letter demanding her resignation didn't arrive until the group was already at Grey Court. So that meant that although their director stepped down and was replaced by their assistant director, who was their head doctor, who really did not want to be director, she was like, I've got enough to do doctoring. I'm not doing the administrative stuff to you. So they appointed an assistant director who took on really all the grunt work. Um, just as happens in my book. But because they were away at Grey Court, the work continued exactly as their director had planned it. So it was a slightly successful coup. Um, it failed in its main mission. <laughs> but anyway, that was what happened with the director. Um, let's see. Where did they get the funds? Alumni. They were funded by alumni. Alumni sent money. They also sent um, lots of knitted goods. Um, the Smithies kept complaining that they wished people would stop sending them um, socks and booties and baby clothes and just send them checks instead. But yes, the alumni you know, contributed generously and they all paid their own room and board. Um, it's sort of like you know, those things now where you go off to do good for people in faraway places, but you pay your own way. That's what they were doing. Um, what was the most surprising to you in the process of researching and writing that no one knows about them now? but that they were a media sensation in their day. Because I had thought that, you know, I had never heard of them. I just assumed that they were kind of niche in their own time, but in fact, they were a thing. Um, and part of, well, part of that is, as I mentioned, their director, this brilliant, diversive woman had from the moment they arrived in France had a PR blitz going. And she continued to work for the unit after she was ousted as director and continued to speak for the unit. And so the unit was besieged by reporters. And they have these hilarious bits in their letters home where they talk about reporters tromping out in the mud to their headquarters and they'll try to ditch them on other people. Um, you know, the people they don't like, like, look, she's over there. Let's send him to talk to her or they would give the reporters chores to do, like rebuilding chicken coops, because they were really busy and they didn't have time to talk to all these reporters, but there were a ton of articles about them to the point where in February of 1918, they were ironically taken over by the Red Cross, the same Red Cross who had refused to sponsor them in the first place. And their Red Cross handler joked that this was a great PR boon for the Red Cross because everyone knew about the Smithies. So that was the biggest surprise to me that they were such a sensation in their own day, but somehow we completely lost them. We wrote them out of the story. 
Okay, and the last thing, because I guess it's getting rather late, as a Smith grad, I'm frankly very embarrassed that no one at Smith had ever written about these women. Okay, so two things. One, the, the lovely women at the Alumni Quarterly tell me that they do in fact periodically run articles about the Smith College Relief Unit. So people should know. That was what they told me. Um, I do feel a little bit guilty that I, as a non-Smithy, have taken the story of these Smithies. I am very honored to have gone to tell the story. Um, I will say my only attenuated claim to smithiness is sort of on the wrong side of the blanket, as it were. Um, my headmistress of my all-girls school, who was a driving force in my life from kindergarten to 12th grade, was a very proud smithy. And you know, when I began researching this book, I realized how so many of the things that she had tried to drum into us, how we had to be better than the boys, how our actions reflected not just on us, but on our school and women everywhere, and how in exchange for the great education we were being given, we owed it to the world to do something good. You know, all of that, I read these letters and all of that just resounded. And I was like, oh my gosh, suddenly this all makes sense. So I, I like to think I am sort of of the lineage of Smith, even if not a Smithy. Oh, who did sponsor them in France? The American Fund for the French Wounded took them on um, and got them their passes and helped them out until they were taken over by the Red Cross, which began consolidating all the aid organizations in early 1918. Because before that was kind of a free for all. There were all of these sort of pop-up aid organizations going over. And you know, I mentioned that there were a lot of women running around the Somme. There were a lot of heiresses who had self-funded organizations like JP Morgan's daughter, Anne Morgan, had um, her headquarters in a chateau called Blairincourt. And the Smithies were terribly jealous because a couple of them called on her and they were like, her chateau has a roof and wallpaper. You know, hers isn't ruined. But anyway, so there were a lot of, um, a lot of little relief organizations running around the Psalm until they sort of became subsumed under the Red Cross. But the answer to the question is the American Fund for French Wounded. Okay, and I think I got everything that time. Thank you so much for all the wonderful questions and being such a fantastic audience. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it and what joy it is to get to chat with Donna on screen. I just wish we were there in person with drinks in our hands. Thank you so much for coming, Lauren. I'm so glad we got you here uh, over Zoom and hopefully sometime in the future in person. Yeah, we hope you can come and visit in person sometime. Yes. I would be absolutely delighted. You won't be able to keep me away. I love a good <laughs> library, especially anything named in Apple <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Yeah.